Hey, it's Ed, and this is Arts and Craft Beer, part of the Pop Counter Culture Media family. That includes the show's Mandatory Cinema, our weekly film discussion podcast, where this week we're covering the films The Art of Self Defense and Nightmare on Elm Street Part 6, Freddy's Dead. We also have Play Me a Story, a narrative focused video game podcast with me and Chris Avila of Unaired Pilot. And then we also have Talking Shit with Angie and Ed, just me and Angelina sort of shooting the shit. We're available on all major podcast platforms, so if you like this podcast, check out one of the other ones and uh, subscribe. And so without further ado, here is our interview with the director of Terrifier, Damien Leone. Uh, Hi, my name is Eduardo. And I'm Angelina. And today we are being joined by the director of Terrifier, one of the coolest horror movies, slasher movies that I've seen in a while, uh, Mr. Damien Leone. Hey guys, how's it going? We're doing pretty good. You know, you're a filmmaker. Can you pinpoint that desire to make films to a specific uh, memory or anything like that? I would say, um, are you familiar with the makeup effects artist Tom Savini? Oh, yeah, yes, yeah, yes. definitely. By any chance? Uh-huh. Hey, he's my idol, and uh, around... I, when I was about seven, I discovered this VHS tape that he'd put out called Scream Greats, and it showed uh, it showed just the behind the scenes of him, you know, creating the special effects of all the horror films he was uh, he worked on. So, and that when I saw that, that really blew my mind when I saw how somebody actually created the monsters, uh, because I'd already been a huge horror movie fan, just a, a movie fan in general. Mm-hmm. I've been watching movies since I was like two years old. Right. So saw that video, I got really interested in makeup effects. And um, a few years later, I went. My mother had taken me to uh, my first horror convention, and um, somebody was selling like a starter Ben Nye makeup kit. And uh, and I knew I wanted to get, I wanted to start getting into makeup effects. So I had bought that kit. I bought a a fake, a real machete that was dulled down and had a semicircle cut out of it, which was a classic Tom Savini gag. Uh, You put it up against your body; it looks like it's buried in the you know yeah and uh i mean the whole reason for going to that heart convention was to meet tom savini uh because i knew he was going to be there so i got to meet him which was amazing um and i bought all this all these supplies and uh, got home and i just started experimenting with all this makeup and stuff on my friends and a lot of like those special effects that i loved uh, that i knew that tom savini had done um they're tricks for the camera so uh, we borrowed my friend's father's camcorder at the time and we started filming them and that really got me interested in filmmaking in general which got me into directing and screenwriting and all those things so right. but it really started with special effects yeah so is that what started first the whole special effects fascination and then filmmaking exactly yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. so it started with the effects and then i would build little like stories around the effects so just start filming the effects and it was really just my first short films were just excuses to show right. the gore like the, the makeup and stuff, you know? Yeah, effects first. I really want to get into how Terrifier came about. Was it the movie idea first or was it Art the Clown? And, and where did your sort of ideas come from? So Art the Clown was a little secondary character in uh, this first, uh, I, I call it my first official short film because up until that point, I'd been making little, little things on, you know, like a little cheap camcorder. Right. And uh, so this was the first time I <clears throat> intended to make a serious short film that was shot on 35 millimeter film. Uh, I had a little crew and it was going to be my calling card, you know, as a filmmaker, as a makeup artist. So I, you know, again, like terrify very, very small on, uh, on plot. It was really just a, a showcase of, you know, creatures and just like an intense sort of eight minutes or 10 minutes or whatever, um, of just cool imagery and things like that. So, um, Art was just this secondary character. I, I knew I always wanted to do something cool with a clown. Uh-huh. And I had this idea of a clown terrorizing a woman on a, a city bus in the middle of the night. You know, she's the only one on the bus. It comes to a stop and uh, all of a sudden a clown gets on and starts messing with her. I don't know where these things come from, but this is just an idea that I had. Right. Little image. And uh, I was like, you know, I'll put that. In. Yeah. It just starts with like cool ideas, little, you know, cool imagery. And uh, I said, I'll put that. That'll be the um, the intro to this short film. It'll start with this scenario. And then the clown will abduct her and deliver her to the hands of these demons, this cult. You know, and we'll take it from there and see what happens. So mm-hmm. everybody, after that short came out and I was showing it to people, everybody liked it, but everybody loved 
the clown. And they were like, wow, you know, you, you, there's something there. I think you should do more stuff with that clown, you know, for sure. So, you know, I listened to these people and uh, the next logical you know, thing to do was to create a short film based solely around art. And that was, I, I made that a few years later and that was the short film Terrifier. And then more people started thinking he was really cool after they saw that. And it was, you know, the next thing was let's get him a feature. So, you know, just progressive the entire way. Um, but it was a really long, hard road to get to Terrifier. I mean, there were things in between. Obviously, there was All Hallows' Eve came in between that. Um, that was never something I wanted to make, but that was the opportunity presented to me at the time. And it was the first time, you know, a distributor was going to put my movie out. And, right, you know, I was right, going to have a yeah. movie on. But the idea was to just that, that was obviously a very low budget um, found footage type movie, more or less. Um, and the, the producer was just looking for things that movies based on Halloween that already existed. He was like looking on YouTube and he found Terrifier, my short film. And he was going to, he was going to like lump it in with other shorts by other filmmakers. Um, but I talked him into letting it be all my movies and my shorts. Like he didn't even know about the ninth circle with Art the Clown. <laughs> so, um, I showed him that, you know, the idea was, you know, we'll just, Art's going to be the, uh, the face of this movie, you know, we're going to put him on the cover. We'll make the whole thing center around him. So it was cool. Um, it definitely, um, you know, got more people interested in art, you know, got him in front of a lot of, a lot more eyes, but, um, I always wanted to make Terrifier and nobody wanted to make a movie based on just based on that character, believe it or not. Cause at the time clowns weren't that popular right, at all. Right. You didn't have, you didn't have the new Pennywise or, uh, you know, this new resurgence of clowns like twisty from American horror yeah. story and all right. those things. So yeah, it was hard to convince people. Um, but eventually we got it, we got it done. How do you react to, I've seen a lot of quotes that people say art is scarier or even better than Pennywise. Yeah, it, it's surreal, man. I don't, um, I just, uh, I embrace it. I, uh, I'm so grateful to see it. It doesn't really sink in, especially when you see people getting tattoos of him and everything like that. It's <laughs> dressing up like him, cosplaying. It's an honor. But we don't want to take it for granted, and especially with the sequel coming up. We really want to deliver, and especially if people think, you know, that, that we've planted a seed that can really blossom into something cool, you know, we really want to deliver that. And we're putting in, you know, 100% into Terrifier 2 just to make sure it's the most badass, satisfying uh, movie experience, horror movie experience you could have. We're excited for it. Well, definitely. I was telling him, because he wasn't familiar with um, All Hallows Eve, I know the original guy, Mark, left. When you did the audition with David, how did you know like he was the guy for art versus Mark? So when Dave came in, he was like the... He was probably like the seventh actor to come into the audition. And right off the bat, I knew that I'd wanted, um, I was looking for just the physicality, first of all. So just, I wanted somebody tall and skinny. So as soon as Dave walked in, I mean, he had, he had the look I was going for. So I just said, you know, I, I hope this guy could, you know, act and do some kind of cool clown shtick. So I, um, I told Dave, I didn't give him a lot of direction. I said, I said, you know, obviously you're this killer clown. I said, uh, pretend like you're cutting off somebody's head, but you're having a really good time while you're doing it. Um, and that, that was it. And uh, he just he just went right there and he, he did this really cool, just really got into it right away. Very animated, very theatrical. And uh, he was really having a good time cutting off that head. And he was tasting the blood and pouring salt on it and everything like that. In fact, you can actually, you can actually admit, you probably already have, but you could see his uh, audition we've posted yeah. online. Um, would you say you were looking for your own Doug Jones? Oh, for sure. I mean, that's a, it's a dream to have a, especially to have an actor that you can continue working with, who's comfortable in the makeup. I mean, that was a, that was the issue primarily with uh, Mike Gianelli, the first Art the Clown was um, those long hours in the makeup. I mean, they're, they're long days. They're, you know, it's, I'd say three hours if I'm lucky to get the, uh, the actor into the makeup. I mean, we've gotten it down to two and a half hours sometimes, but uh, I'm constantly doing other things while I'm making him up, so I have to right. like make him up a little. We set up shots, talk to the actors, things like that. On uh, Terrifier 2, we're, we're closing in on, I think Dave's been in the makeup maybe 30 times or more, um, and they're like 20-hour days. Um, so it's it's not fun. It's, it's, it's brutal. It takes a toll. Um, so to have somebody who, you know, who 
can embrace the makeup and, you know, won't complain too much. <laughs> um, it's, it's cool. It's cool to have. So, um, yeah, it works. Well, I want to ask, because there is that black and white motif with uh, with his costuming and his makeup. Is there any sort of like a mime element that you thought into this? No, I mean, that was all conceived at the beginning. Well, I mean, I knew from the start he was going to be silent because the, the, the slashers, I love all the slashers. Obviously, I grew up on all of them. Um, I love Freddy. But Freddy's obviously the one who speaks and he's very wisecracking and this and that. Like I gravitated a little more toward the silent killers. And um, so I wanted my clown to be silent like Michael Myers or yeah. you know, Jason. He is a quiet killer, but he definitely does have that sort of trolley personality of Freddy Krueger. And without any words, yes. it's all in the body language and performance. That's really cool. Exactly. Thank you. And that, that was another conscious thing we did because art is just a combination of all the slashers that I love. So that his personality is clearly inspired by Freddy. So that's that's where Freddy comes through uh, with art. Um, you know, Leatherface is a bit of the grittiness. Uh, you know, Michael and Jason is just the brutal, silent slasher, things like that. So they're all they're all in there somewhere. As far as the black and white, that I have to give credit to the original It for making that decision because mm -hmm. I wanted to stray as far away from Pennywise, the Tim Curry Pennywise, as mm -hmm. possible. Because what you know, at the time, you know, he was the king of the killer clowns. I mean, yeah. it arguably still is. You know, I did not want to step on his toes in any way. If you're going to do something, you know, try and bring something original to it or something you have. That's why he's black and white. Uh, it doesn't have any color. He doesn't have hair like Pennywise. He doesn't, uh, he uses weapons. Pennywise doesn't. You know, Pennywise speaks. He doesn't. So you go down the line. Yeah. Definitely got to give thanks to Pennywise. Well, I watched it yesterday. Angelina's been a big fan of it and I watched it yesterday in preparation. So you just saw it for the first time yesterday? Yesterday, yeah. yeah. I've been bugging him for like two years. years and one of my favorite bands ajj even has a song called terrifier uh inspired by your movie and when i heard that i thought that should have been the sign uh but i'm glad i watched it one of the things that really drove me crazy and, I, and i'm telling you like it, it literally had my fist in the air it was when art shot tara he's a slasher <laughs> yeah. he is a, he's not supposed to shoot anyone i saw that and i was like fuck yeah oh cool yeah thanks man yeah that's um that's the most polarizing part of the movie for sure uh, that's a, that's a love it or hate it moment. Uh, we knew it was gonna, we knew it was gonna piss people off. Uh, just, just killing the Tara character. I knew that was really going to piss people off. That, yeah, um, that, was a, that was another big surprise for me. I thought she was yeah. going to, I thought she was going to be our Ellen Ripley a little bit. Yeah. I wanted to, I figured it's been a while since we had that, uh, that psycho moment where we took the, the lead character out like halfway through the movie. So I figured, uh, we'd bring that back. And, um, you know, I did give Art a gun in All Hallows' Eve, in the, well, which is the original uh, short film, Terrifier. These are movies that you've seen a million times. And, like, I don't want to stray too far from what we love, right? So my idea is to take all that stuff that we love, but then just, like, implant these little twists and turns to just, like, keep it new, keep it fresh, keep the audience on their toes, you know? Yeah. So... Sometimes the things I try and experiment with fail miserably, and sometimes they're kind of cool, but you have to keep taking those risks. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so it was just like a little challenge I gave myself. And, you know, guns are very scary, um, very relevant. And, you know, and so I said, is it possible to put the, a gun in the hands of a character like Jason? Because I think the only time you'd ever seen something close to that was in. Halloween four when uh, Michael Myers uses the gun to in <laughs> impale somebody. Right. But uh, I said, Let let's see, let's see. I'm just going to try it. So we gave Art the gun and I said, if he is going to use the gun, we have to use it in like the sickest way. So he'll take out the main character in a shocking way. And then he won't just shoot her once. Like, he'll, you know, <laughs> yeah. Art's whole MO is just to, it's like the foreplay. He's like, he doesn't want, he just, he's like the cat playing with the mouse. You know, he really doesn't want to kill them right away. So uh, right. I was going to have him, you know, just keep shooting her, making her suffer. And even after she's dead, then he just, you know, takes her face off. And <laughs> so it's just, uh, I, I like, you know, I like it. I thought it was a cool choice. A lot of people hate it, but that's, you're never going to please everybody. Right. I, I'm a fan of it. So, I mean, I get the impression that as a writer, it seems like you're having fun with it. I mean, not only do you subvert expectations, but what you give us is more badass. As a writer, how was your how was your experience writing this, and and how did that evolve into the sequel? Yeah, um, let me see if I even remember the process of writing Terrifier One. It was so long ago. 
Um, I know the second movie took like I took very, very serious uh, writing that script. Um, and I did because Terrifier 2 is a lot more of a traditional structure, traditional narrative, whereas Terrifier 1 is is almost unfolds in real time. Mm -hmm. It all happens like in the moment with the characters, like you're just thrust into the situation as if you were them. Uh, there's no answers. They don't know what's going on. The audience doesn't know what's going on. And it's just, and then it's, it's like an hour and 20 minute just experience. Two is a lot more. It takes place over the course of a few days. There's a lot more characters, a lot more character dynamics. I would say I spent maybe three months writing Terrifier 2 where I did nothing else but write, focus on writing wow. that script. Yeah. And my process was it would take me probably till like 8 o'clock at night to really get in the mood to start writing. Right, and yeah. I would write till like 6 o'clock in the morning. So that whole script was written in the dark, in the middle of the night. In uh, the witching hour. Just, <laughs> it's the hardest part of the entire process. I mean, physically, filming the movie is, is, is really, really difficult and takes a toll. But, you know, when it's just you and the blank page and you're just creating from nothing, um, it's very challenging. But oh, yeah. uh, rewarding if it works. Uh, we'll find out soon enough. I just curious, like, what is your love? This has nothing to do with Terrifier, or maybe it does. But your love from the Lost Boys come. I like was dying so much <laughs> to ask you that. <laughs> oh, we could talk about the Lost Boys for two hours. That, that's my <laughs> so so that I mean I have so many favorite movies. Like it's like how people say it's like you know picking children you can't or whatever, but. There's a, I say Lost Boys is my favorite movie of all time. That might have been the first movie I saw in the movie theaters. I'm not sure, but um, it had such a profound impact on me. My mother took me to see it when I was four. And uh, I remember it like it was yesterday. I, I remember reactions in the audience. I remember like the smell of the theater and popcorn and like all kinds of wild things that, you know, still to this day, I just, you know, I can go back in time and think about it. But that was, and still is to this day, it's just one of my favorite movies. I think it's like a perfect, perfect horror movie. I don't think there's anything like it. Uh, th that tone, that atmosphere, the style, it's, it's just, it checks all the boxes. I mean, it's, it's scary, it's sexy, it's funny, it's strange. Um, the soundtrack is incredible. Yep. The characters, I re really, the characters are yeah. great. They're just great characters. I mean, you feel like you know them by the time that movie's over. I did not know this until you posted, you know, on your story that De Niro's mohawk was a bald cap. And I was like, I did not know this. You know, you love film. And before he even watched Terrifier, before we even came to you to be on our podcast, I was telling him, like, hey, like, I've seen this movie Terrifier. I found out, like, the uh, director wrote it did the special effects for it and you know that's just something refreshing that i think the horror community hasn't seen in a while and i think that's why a lot of people took a liking to your movie also oh, like, thanks. <laughs> what other films have like really inspired you to just go for it that's uh, that's a good question i mean again it's not just horror movies mm -hmm. um i love all films so i could i could talk about any genre any any film um uh, I'm just obsessed with movies. It, de I mean, it, it really depends. It could be anything. It depends what day of the week it is. You know, you never know what's going to inspire you or, or what, you know, it could be a different filmmaker or a different screenwriter. Every week it just it just changes. I mean, I'm constantly reading books by filmmakers, watching documentaries. Uh, I love watching, listening to audio commentaries on, on DVDs. I mean, it's, it's the best. I mean, Jaws is uh, another one that I always call my favorite movie of all time. Uh, still to this day, I've seen it. I can't even tell you how many times I've seen it. And it, it loses nothing, nothing, none of its power. Nope. <laughs> nothing. That's like a film that could clearly be taught in film schools, just like a perfect movie with just structure and characters and, you know, memorable, you know, pop culture, dialogue, music, uh, hero's journey, structures, everything like that. It's, it's just a perfect movie. So that inspires me. Uh, what really inspires me is just, uh, you know, filmmakers who just have insane drives and it might not even be a filmmaker just like when i see people who are just incredibly driven i mean that inspires me to get off my ass and, and do things and not complain and just you know suffer if you have to but i mean you really uh, people ask me a lot especially like young filmmakers like how do you get into it all this stuff and you really just have to do it i mean you just have to pick up a camera 
of your phone, get people, get your friends or whatever, and just make the movie. There's no excuses. There's certainly no financial excuses anymore because you can shoot a, a movie <laughs> on your phone. You can learn everything, everything that you need to know about technically, uh, you know, editing a movie in Premiere or Photoshop and things like that. So just watch eat, breathe, sleep movies, you know, learn, watch the classics, you know, listen to filmmakers talk and just get the equipment, get your phone and just actually start making something. And you're just going to, it's constantly making mistakes. I mean, that's all it yeah. is. You know, that's all we do is make mistakes over and over. And you just, you know, hopefully each movie just gets better and you make less and less mistakes. And we'll be back after this quick ad break. Hey everybody, I'm Brandon the Boss Blacker. And I'm Lunchbox, that's one word, capital L, capital B. Thank you very much. And if you are into the world of professional wrestling, heavy metal music, horror movies, comic books, video games, and more, you can find us airing live episodes on Facebook every Friday at 10.30 Pacific Standard Time at the Talkin' Shop with the Boss in the Box Facebook page. That's right, we have digital episodes dropping on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher Radio and Buzzsprout every Sunday at 6 a.m. So come find us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and where can they find us? At Talking Shop with the Boss and the Box. Hey, it's Ed again, here to talk about Unheard Pilot, my latest movie. Unheard Pilot is the story of Chad Delano, who is filming the pilot of his public access TV show, where he goes to local bars in the town of Adderton and just sort of gets to meet the locals. One day, he meets Samantha, and she's this really cool, interesting person who, who he really wants to interview, but then comes her crazy, weird, creepy husband. It's an unaired pilot because what Chad captures becomes evidence in a court case. So to check out what it's all about, go to our Pop Counter Culture YouTube channel and check out Unaired Pilot. Let us know what you think. And now back to our show. Is there a big blue whale? Is there a Moby Dick of a movie idea that you just want to do more than anything else? Like your big dream project? There is. And it's a uh, it's a zombie film. Nice. Because that's my favorite <laughs> subgenre. Drug Romero is my hero. His Dawn of the Dead is another one of my favorite movies of all time. So my zombie script, obviously a zombie script is just huge. You know, you need big bucks to do it. My script is a big zombie movie. It's not like a little intimate Night of the Living Dead versus people trapped in a house. I mean, it's right. it's lots of people. It's a big location stuff like that so but it would be centered in george romero's world and it would probably be somewhere between dawn of the dead and day of the dead like in that world maybe a little closer to day of the dead and it's the coolest thing i've written i i oh my god i mean that's my that's my dream project you know i originally wanted uh the main character i wanted to be played by uh roddy piper because i'm such a huge they live fan <laughs> I don't, we'll see i mean i'm gonna i'm gonna try shopping that around uh after after Terrifier 2 comes out and we'll see we'll see what happens another thing that, that I liked about Terrifier uh, was the look of the movie it looks different than most other horror movies in the sense that like it has a lot of color to it but it's never oversaturated it's a very uh tasteful use of color but it's it's a vibrant movie from beginning to end I mean there's this one shot that sticks in my head it's in the beginning of the movie and it's just Art the Clown walking towards the girls and, and while they're at the car but behind them there's this building with like these red lights like just coming out the window I think it's a good signifier that this guy's dangerous more than anything but like uh, as far as like the cinematography of the movie how much of that was predetermined and how much of that was just down to resources and stuff on the set well that's my um, the cameraman is my buddy George Stuber he's also he shot Terrifier 2 again and uh, he's actually co-producing Terrifier 2 with me nice. uh, super talented dude people don't realize we're working with so little, so uh -huh. little, especially on the first Terrifier. Um, I said this recently in an interview because there's all these rumors that the movie cost a uh, hundred thousand to eight hundred thousand. It cost <laughs> it cost thirty five thousand, and then it, then it wound up going up to about like fifty fifty five right. tops. Oh, so that's what it cost. So we really had nothing. We had very little equipment, very little lights. Um, it was a very low end uh, 
red camera that we use. You know, as far as the lighting is concerned, I'm a huge fan of, uh, you know, old school Dario Argento. Like, I mean, I, I couldn't go that crazy because um, right, right. his movie really looked like like a carnival and yeah. stuff. But, uh, but I wanted to put a little bit of that essence in there. So we did go a little over the top with uh, some of the lighting choices and stuff. Especially when you're dealing with low budget, the more you do with the lights and things like that, if you can throw some colored gels in, in there and stuff like that, it does make it look a little more expensive, believe it or not. It's, it's mm -hmm. that simple. So we try and do that as much as we can. Um, so yeah, art, walking, you know, we really had to beef up that imagery. So I, I just said, yeah, let's just blow out that window in the back, throw some red. It's like he's coming. He's yeah. literally like hell coming for them. That's exactly so, what I got so too, man. How did you get Paul Wiley and like, how did you guys discuss about the score? Because I think it's great. I showed him yesterday and oh. it's great. Yeah, Paul's fantastic. Um, yeah. I made a, a Frankenstein movie a while ago and uh, we just put out, um, we put out like a call for composers on one of these sites and he just submitted and um, I didn't know who he was or anything like that. Um, you know, for people who don't know, it's uh, it's Marilyn Manson's guitarist. Yeah, that's oh. what I was and, uh, yeah, I know that. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's just like the coolest guy. And, you know, we have such a simple shorthand relationship. I mean, I'll just give him some inspiration, some inspirational tracks where I'm like, oh, I'm trying to go for this like John Carpenter vibe, or I'll throw him a few names and I'll send him some tracks and then he'll just go and create something fantastic. I mean, we already started creating the score for part two. And he, it's it's oh. so far it's, it's incredible. He's created some amazing tracks so far, um, and he's reworked the Terrifier theme. There's there's like a couple of different versions yeah. of that theme nice. in this yeah. one. Nice. So it's gonna I, be cool. I yeah. love it. It's a soundtrack that I listen to daily, especially yeah the original theme and then the altered version. Oh. Yeah, I love it. Damien, I just noticed you're wearing your Terror Threads Terrifier shirt, and I was going to wear that one today, but I have the exact same one, but today I went with Twilight Zone. <laughs> it's dead, but I was uh, going to wear oh, that's it. That's my favorite. Yeah. That's my favorite show of all time. Did you know that? No. Um, Rod Sterling, right? Not the new yep, Twilight Zone. <laughs> I have a poster on the yeah. I think that's like everybody's dream is to shoot a movie on 35 millimeter, right? I mean, because I mean, 35, that is sort of like the holy grail. Wow, well, it, it was it was intense shooting on 30, especially going from, I never worked with film in my life. I wasn't even working with high-end camcorders before, like before that. They were like these really low-end JVC camcorders that I was shooting short <laughs> films on. Yeah. So I just went from zero to 100. <laughs> um, it's so expensive that you can. I think we could only do um, like five takes, you know, per setup on digital cameras. I could do like 13, uh, yeah. 20 takes if I want. And I do often and I piss everybody off, but I, I love doing a lot of takes. Yeah. Um, also, you don't know you don't know what you're getting uh, when you're shooting on film. Uh, I don't even know if we had a monitor. So I, I just like, you know, I would set up the shot, look through the viewfinder, hope, hope the DP was getting what I wanted. And then you had to wait for it to be developed to see it. Right. Um, it's It was so expensive. Like, we didn't even get it properly transferred and everything like that. So, I mean, you see that short in uh, in All Hallows' Eve. It's the first one, the ninth circle. I mean, it looks very digital and low budget, even though it is 35 millimeter. Um, so, one day I'd like to – I still have the film in a closet. I'd like to, you know, retransfer that properly. That would be cool. I love the look of 35. I mean, I would love to still shoot on film, you know, if it looked like a real – real movie i had the money to do it properly and everything like that but it's just it's so expensive and it's really just so so antiquated at this point and you know we're shooting on the ari in this oh, one nice. with like really 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 good lenses and it looks it looks fantastic so that's cool and you know exactly what you're getting shooting with film like i said you can only do five takes i think uh, or so maybe three three to five so you have to be a lot more prepared you can't screw around uh you need to know exactly what you're getting you really have to be on your a game not that you're not that i'm not when i'm shooting on digital but um it's kind of more of a free-for-all you know you can like i said you could do 20 takes you can keep going yeah. yeah but you're you're constantly constantly learning like i said before from just the mistakes I've made all all kinds of mistakes constantly. I'm constantly learning from my my failures, um, mm -hmm. and I also I think it's important to embrace embrace failures because you're gonna yeah. you're gonna learn from them hopefully art and get better. But you know I've made movies just where I've went so far off the rails. You know dialogue and story when that wasn't my strong suit whatsoever. Then there's things where the effects were just terrible and they should have never been in the movie, but I let them go. Yeah, I mean it, it happens. You're gonna you know and you're. 
you're making mistakes in front of you know your entire audience right. so which yeah. kind of yeah. sucks you know it's not like these are <laughs> mistakes you're making in the privacy of your own home right but it's all right it toughens you and uh and yeah and hopefully you're you're better on the next one is it ever weird seeing how your younger self was operating or, or thinking about film compared to how you see it now uh, some movies I've made, I can't, uh, I can't even watch them. I'm too, too mortified <laughs> to even watch them. Yeah. Uh, some things, uh, some things I still think are cool. Like I think the, uh, the original Terrifier short film is still a solid short film, which is the last story in All Hallows Eve. Uh -huh. Um, yeah, that one just clicked. I felt like everything and almost everything in that one worked pretty well. So I'm happy with that one. I'm very happy with what I'm seeing in uh, Terrifier 2 right now. So that's exciting. But I just want to clarify, I do like your decision to kill Tara off, but I just felt emotionally invested in that character. So it was a surprise. Where did you come up with the Dawn kill scene? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was a good one. <laughs> the infamous hacksaw scene. So I was just um, sort of uh, researching medieval torture methods. Because uh, I wanted to do something really cool in this one. And I found a method that it's debatable whether or not they actually did it. But, um, yeah. I mean, just like that. I mean, they would tie people upside down naked um, and saw them saw them in half. Um, but it was a big saw. You know, it was like a person on each end. Yeah. And supposedly, because they'd leave you hanging there before they sawed you. And uh, the blood would just drain to all your lower extremities so you could actually survive for a while before you died so Holy they said shit. you know but then other people said you would just die from shock immediately um that that's nonsense so who knows uh, hopefully right. it didn't exist but <laughs> so that was so i was like yeah that sounds pretty wild i'd never seen that before we needed a show-stopping kill scene in the movie we knew this was a low-budget film it probably wasn't going to be seen by a lot of people you're going up against the big boys you're going right. up against Hollywood mm -hmm. and you're going to be judged the same as anybody else. I mean, if people don't like your movie, they're going to tell you they, they don't care <laughs> if you spent a dollar yeah. on it. Right. It will rip you. I said, look, I'm a special makeup effects artist. I can bring a lot of things to this project that we can afford to, you know, have with somebody else. Um, nobody's going to tell me there's something I can do. I'm going to put my all into it. Let's show the audience something that you're not going to see in a Hollywood horror movie and really show them everything from start to finish. <laughs> yeah. And that's and uh, that's what we did and thankfully it came out it came out pretty cool. I mean people still talk about it. So Yeah. Uh, so the problem now is topping that in part 2. That's the problem. Oh yeah. <laughs> Uh, would you say you were looking to do something big, like how Nightmare on Elm Street had the Tina death ceiling kill? Were you trying to shoot oh, maybe yeah. something like yeah, that big? It's so hard to make a movie. So if you're gonna if you're gonna do it, at least try and make something that people are gonna talk about or is gonna have an effect on people. I, I say that to people who reach out to me as well, you know, about asking, you know, to become a filmmaker and this and that, what to do, asking for advice. I say if you're going to make something, make something that's really going to stand out. There's so much competition, especially now on YouTube. You have the whole world is making uh, things. Yeah. Right. right. What are you going to bring to the table that's going to make you stand out above the rest? Um, so like even even if it comes down to showing, you know, just making exploitation and making this really insane imagery that's going to stand out, you know, just go, go for it. You know, right. go for it. It's Completely acceptable in the horror genre. What, what was what was shooting that scene like? Oh, very intense. Uh, that wasn't a fun day. Uh, thank God, Catherine's a trooper. But yeah, that was a, that was a crazy scene. And and to give Catherine credit, she was so gung ho about that scene. Actually, I, I met with her. We had coffee. We were talking about the the character and about the movie. And she said, if we're going to do this, you know, that's the scene. She's like, let's, you know, let's make sure that that scene is done right. And it's like, really, we knock it out of the park. Whereas any other, most actresses probably wouldn't even take the uh, the role because of that. Right. And on top of that, they would probably complain. But she made it so easy. But it was very intense because everything you see happening to her is really happening to her. There's no, you know, there's no trickery. So we're really hanging her upside down by her ankles. Um, she could only hang upside down for like 30 seconds. So, I mean, cameras are rolling, everybody's in place, you know, holding her up, you know, we yell action, she's brought down, we shoot for 30 seconds, then we got to rush in and get her back up and 
it, it was it was crazy. And, and there's just things that happen that you don't take into account. Like, you know, she's upside down. We're spraying blood and blood's going up her nose and down her throat and all this <laughs> crazy stuff. It was intense. I could not wait for that to, to be over. But, uh, <laughs> but, you know, we got it done, it thankfully. Was, and it came out good. Yeah, it came out really yeah. good. Yeah. Did she, like, suffer any, like, physical sickness? Because, you know, your blood, your blood is rushing to your head. Did she get sick at all or anything like that? Yeah, she had actually told me that I think the next day or, or so she wasn't feeling well and went to the doctor and they checked her out. And I forgot what it was, but something was off. And she told the, the doctor what was what she'd been doing. And he's like, oh, yeah, that, that'll do it. Like, yeah. And there was something there was something wrong. I mean, she was fine. It did, uh, it did rattle her. Another scene that I really want to talk about, um, when Art has the doll in his hand. And the uh, the crazy lady is trying to appeal to his humanity and all that. I really like that scene because one of the things I like about Art is that he's almost like alien. He has the, that weird messed up teeth. He's he's this troll, like a Freddy Krueger, but he's quiet, which makes him even more creepier. So I was really fascinated in that scene because a part of me knew there was no way that lady was going to leave that room alive. But I really also thought, given the sort of uh, risks that you took... Uh, with the story that it, I, don't, I really didn't know what to expect at all in that moment. What was the conception of that? To me, that was the most awkward scene to shoot through the entire movie. Uh -huh. um, and I wanted to, I wanted to just, I wanted to just pit these two crazy characters together and <laughs> just see what the hell. Would happen. And, uh, and that was the idea. Um, and I knew there would be this tension filling the scene and the audience wouldn't know what the hell to expect or, or at what moment, Art's gonna snap and attack her just like a you know like a tiger or something like that. So I wanted to just like play with that and drag it out, and build up the suspense as much as possible. Right. Here's another like way that I hopefully subverted your expectations of that scene. You know, when she's reaching in to touch him, I think the obvious thing to do would to have was would be to have him attack her. Yeah. And he actually embraces her and goes in and starts sucking his thumb like a baby and she yeah. starts <laughs> it was so weird but i just wanted to keep taking him to a really weird place yeah so the audience didn't know what the hell was going on or what to expect but it's art so then yeah. the next time you see him you saw what happened yeah and, and this is gonna sound a little weird but great use yeah. of tits in this movie man uh, <laughs> uh, no i mean no because it, it fits into the subversive thing i mean usually when you see a tit in a slasher movie it's supposed to be you know, it's excuse the word titillating. Uh, but the first time we see we see tits in the movie, it's it's she's hanging upside down, and she's about to get murdered. There's nothing titillating about that. And then you have that scene with the with the mother where she's trying to like appeal to him by being a mother. And then in the next shot, he's wearing her breasts. You know, like what, yeah. that was such a like a, a, an interesting imagery, man. So I just want to give you kudos on just like going that in detail with your with your like punk rock subversion of all that stuff. <laughs> Thanks, man. Yeah, I don't like to, um, believe it or not, I don't like to use, like, gratuitous sex in the movie. Yeah. Um, whereas, like, that's, like, one thing where I stray from the uh, 80s slashers, um, where they had to throw in, you know, the TNA, even if it had nothing to do with the movie. Yeah. The reason why Dawn's Naked, uh, Upside Down, is not just, I mean, it's just, like, a practical thing. It's, like, why is he going to saw through clothing? Right, you yeah, know, that mean, too. It just doesn't, doesn't, yeah, and, like, let's just make her as vulnerable as possible. And with the with the crazy lady, him wearing her skin, that all started with my ex-girlfriend at the time. So I was writing the script. I sent her a draft, and she said, oh, it would be really cool if you can write something where Art's wearing a wig. All right, that's all she said. So then I, I had this image now, this imagery of Art with long hair. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, yeah, I guess that would, that would be kind of creepy. And then I'm thinking and I'm trying to get in the mindset of Art the Clown. And I'm like, well, why would he be wearing a wig? I'm like, it's Art. He'd probably be wearing a scalp. For some reason, he wants to dress like a woman right now. Yeah. So is he really going to stop with the scalp? He's probably going to go full woman and take every part of her. Right. So that's, that's just the mindset. And that's where that came from. So it's not a reason to be gratuitous sexually. I mean, even though it does come across that way, but... But again, yeah, it's not something I'm really into. Just having people have sex in the movies and things like that just right. for the sake of it. Yeah. We, we have Pornhub yeah. now. We have a place for that. We don't need to have been hard in the movies for no reason no more. Yeah. <laughs> hey, it's Ed. And I'm here to talk about one of my movies, Escaping a Spinning Room. It's a movie that came out in 2014. It's about Jamie, an alcoholic who is recovering from a breakup the way alcoholics normally do. And one day he calls his friend Barry, who he hasn't seen in a while, just sort of for some emotional support and to catch up. 
In the process, Barry convinces Jamie to burn a box of memories of him and his ex. And this sort of unfolds into a exploration of both of these characters, their relationship with women, with alcohol, and their dependency on each other to keep the cycle going. Check out Escaping a Spinning Room. It's under the Old Works playlist on the Pop Counterculture YouTube channel. Check it out. And if you liked it, make sure to let me know. Share it with your friends. And without further ado, back to our show. About Terrifier. I love how it made me feel. It had me on the edge of my seat. And I felt like I haven't got that in a horror movie like nowadays. Um, is there any franchise like now that you just totally hate? Uh, like I don't like the Conjuring films. I've only seen the first Conjuring movie. Um, I thought it was good. Um, that they're not horror movies today are really not my cup of tea. Mm -hmm. um, I, they don't have the same effect on me. I don't know if it's a nostalgia thing. Nothing captures that feeling of the movies I grew up loving nowadays. Instead of watching the new horror movies, I mean, unless there's something that looks incredible that I need to see, I just keep rewatching the classics, yeah. like for the '80s and. 70s. Yeah. Um, some early <laughs> 90s ones. You know, I mean, there's like little gems here and there that I like. Um, I did like Hereditary. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Loved yeah. Hereditary. Definitely, definitely interested in seeing the Candyman remake. But I'm, I'm not a big fan of remakes, especially remakes of classics. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, Unless you're really something new to the table. Yeah. Uh, which they, they rarely do. Rarely do. Yeah. So. I can see, I mean, I don't know how long you guys are going to go with Terrifier, but I told him I can see it being like another franchise of like Freddy, Jason, Michael. You know, I can definitely see it being <laughs> an iconic franchise. Terrifier 2, man. Uh, without saying too much, what can we expect? Um, so we really, really cranked it up to 11 on this one. It is just huge it's not even in the same universe as terrifier one it's so oh so yeah. drastically big the kills are are insane uh see my goal going into this one was to make it like the sequels that i grew up loving that sort of in my opinion top the originals mm -hmm. like uh evil dead 2 or uh, dawn of the dead hell yeah yeah so i really wanted to make this a lot more epic in scope and i think we achieve that um, i'm also most excited for our main protagonist in this one uh sienna the main I, I mean it's known that she's the final girl in this one so it's not too much of a spoiler but um uh, i put so much so much love and energy into making that character awesome that i can't wait to see what people think about her so uh, Art's going to have like a nice formidable opponent to go up against uh, in the final act of this one. So nice. I'm excited about that. But again, you know, you never know what's going to happen because it is Art the Clown. You don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> um, and that's why we love him. In some areas, it's vastly different. But we made sure that we stood true to everything that people liked in the first one. I mean, the consensus of what worked in the first one were, is still here. You know, there's a lot of problems people have with the first one, rightfully so. A lot of areas that could have been fixed, and hopefully we've worked out those shortcomings. It's going to be very satisfying. It's going to be a movie that you're going to want to see with an audience. I really hope that we can get it into some theaters or something, because yeah. I yeah. think there's going to be a lot of screaming, cheering, you know, just yeah. shouting, all kinds of crazy reactions to this one. Uh, I also haven't said this to anybody yet in all the interviews I've done because right now I'm actually I'm cutting the beginning of the movie uh, and there's a kill scene in the first two minutes and I think I I think it's safe to say that it is the goriest opening two minutes of any slasher film in existence oh like it's it's it's, it's, it's insane it's in, I could say that now after seeing yeah. what it is uh, so people are gonna be really really. Uh, yeah. satisfied with it i can't wait <laughs> um damien i gotta ask i don't know if you even have an answer for it you know with the whole pandemic going on do you guys have any, any initial like release date are you guys gonna do the whole video on demand or are you guys just gonna wait till theaters come back it's really hard to say i mean the the pandemic really did affect us um you know it was fine at first because because I'm editing it, so I got to just take all the footage that we had. Obviously, we had to shut down production, but then I just got to edit everything. Mm -hmm. But now it's just now it's going on a lot longer than we anticipated. So we really have to make sure our crew and our actors feel comfortable going back. 
And now it's a SAG production, so there's all these guidelines that they put in play that right. are really, you know, difficult to meet. So we just have to, we have to make sure that we're ready to go. But um, the good news is, is that 95% of the movie is shot. Nice. Um, so like we're really, we're really like at the finish line. So, but I, I don't know. We wanted to have it out in uh, Halloween uh, this year. I mean, that's not looking like a reality right now. Yeah. But, I mean, we're not going to do what Halloween did. We're not going to push it back, like, a year to get it out of Halloween. Oh God, so as soon yeah. as it's ready to be released, we're going <laughs> to. I yeah. just want to let you know, I would risk my I life. Think... <laughs> yeah, gonna I would risk my room. life for <laughs> <laughs> Terrifier 2. Um, I don't know if you remember, you, po- you posted something about Terrifier. Like, you weren't sure about, yeah, the initial release date. And I had commented on there, like, because, you know, they just came out with, like, oh, there's a second wave of corona. And I had commented on there, like, if I freaking die before this movie comes out, I'm going to hunt you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, literally, this Do is not. the antis- I won't, but maybe David. But um, this is the, the like anticipated movie i'm waiting for if i have to wait till next year i will but i just want to make it known i will risk getting corona to watch this movie uh, i do appreciate that yeah. um as soon as it's ready and as soon as it has distribution in place we're going to release it we're not going to hold off until you know a specific date or anything like that um and i just i promise you it's going to be worth the wait yeah. it's going to be worth the wait i really i mean fans of it fans who love the first one I really had, they have no idea what this one is compared, you know, like people who are just coming in, you know, like they don't have any expectations or anything like that. I mean, they're just going to come in and see it. Right. But it is, like I said, it is just so much bigger than the first one. I want to scream right now. <laughs> you're going to love it. Yeah, yeah. It's just, it starts, it starts off with a bang and it just yeah. never, never lets up. So that, that, that's what's up, man. Well, that's how I felt with the first one. And now, <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, we're going to let you go, Damien. Uh, we really appreciate you taking an hour of your time with us. Yeah, thanks we a We really lot, appreciate it. Oh, uh, it's my pleasure. You guys are awesome. Uh, thank you. So, thank awesome you so people. much. <laughs> Have me on again when uh, when Terrifier 2 comes out. I really want to know what you think about it. Okay, oh, yeah, yeah. You I, got it. You know, we'll be back <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, Damien. We're going to let you go. Have a good one, man. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Take care. Okay, bye-bye. And that was our discussion with Damian Leone, a super cool, super talented guy. Once again, we are part of the Pop Counterculture Media family. We're on all major podcast platforms along with SoundCloud and YouTube. Subscribe and check out our other shows. And we want to hear what you guys have to say. So follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Pop Counterculture Media. Until then, thanks for listening.